When you see something happen, you have to assume it's for your good. You have to assume that Hashem did it. Episode number 93. Welcome to the Torah Podcast. Lessons from authentic Judaism. Get the tools and inspiration you need for personal growth. Hosted by Rabbi Mitterhoff. Shalom, this is Rabbi Elio Mitterhoff with this week's Torah Podcast. This week, we're going to have a special holiday edition on Purim. The secret to happiness, learning to say I don't know. We're going to have a powerful parable about a pen that writes itself. A great story about Rabbi Tzkak Silberstein and peace in your home, having a happy pouring. And now, a special holiday edition. Grab this historic moment and change your life. Rev Yitzchak Hutner has an unbelievable piece on Purim. He brings a verse from Tehillim. The verse says, And all the nations of the earth will witness the salvation wrought by our God. That's Tehillim 98.3. And the Gemara Megillah explains when was that. When did this take place? This was during the days of Mordechai and Esther. So he brings down that Hashem himself does mitzvahs. Which mitzvah does Hashem do? He does the mitzvah tefillin. It says, for example, Gemara Brachos, that Hashem wears tefillin. What's written inside the tefillin of Hashem? What's written is, who could compare to my people Yisrael, who are one and unique, united nation on earth? In other words, the mitzvah that he does gives praise to the Jewish people. Just like we do mitzvahs to give praise to Hashem, Hashem does mitzvahs in order to bring praise to God. But he, brings, but he extends this even further. He says an unbelievable idea. He says, just like we also have mitzvahs which are not defined, those mitzvahs are called a rishus. And the Pasuk in Mishle says, And all your ways you should know Hashem. In other words, everything we do has to be a mitzvah. It's not just a lulav and a sukkah and the Rosh Hashanah blowing the shofar. Those mitzvahs are defined by the Torah. They're very clear. But everything else that we're doing is also supposed to be a mitzvah. So he wants to extend it. Just like Hashem does mitzvahs which are defined, he also does mitzvahs which are non-defined. Now, what's the difference between a defined mitzvah and a non-defined mitzvah, which are calling a reshus, which means optional? In other words, you can choose. You can choose who you marry. You can choose what kind of job you want to do. You have a lot of details in your life that you can choose. But they're not defined. You choose it. It's called a reshus. So what's the difference between that type of mitzvah and a defined mitzvah? The difference is when you see a person doing a mitzvah, shaking a lulav, or blowing a shofar on Rosh Hashanah, it's quite clear what that person is doing. He's doing a mitzvah. Everybody sees that it's giving praise to God. Everybody sees that that person is doing that thing for the sake of God. But on the other hand, if you do mitzvahs that are reshus, who you marry and where you work, it's not so clear whether the guy is really doing it for Hashem or not. It only comes out in the long run. If you see a guy doing a certain act, over time you can little by little understand what the guy is doing, and you can see that he's also doing it to praise God. He's also doing it for God's sake. So the same thing with Hashem. Hashem also has these two types of mitzvahs. Which types of mitzvahs, for example, are defined? For example, Kriyas Yamsuf. When God took us out of Mitzrayim, and he split the Red Sea, you see clearly there, everybody sees right away, wow, what did Hashem do for the Jewish people? He's giving praise to the Jewish people. He's giving value to the Jewish people. On the other hand, when Hashem does other things for the Jewish people, which are not so clearly defined, so those things are called a reshus in the world of mitzvahs. But you can't see clearly what's going on. So he wants to explain that's the story of Purim. That's the story in the Megillah Esther. It takes a long time, and only at the end do you figure out that God was there at every move. You can't see it from, from moment to moment. You only see it over time, all the different things that happen. The fact that Esther got taken in to the king's palace, and the fact that the king got woken up in the middle of the night, and he wanted somebody to read to him, and he happened to read to him that Mordecai saved his life, and all the other small events which appear to be Alpi Teva, Alpi Nature, so those things, you can't see clearly where's God in these things. All the things that God does over time, we can't see them. The miracles, those are like the defined mitzvahs, where the, the non-miracles, teva, that's considered like a rishos, optional. 
But each thing that Hashem is doing is for the sake of the Jewish people. He's helping the Jewish people. And in the end of the story, we saw the tremendous Kiddush Hashem. We saw how Hashem saved the people, and that's what the verse said. The verse of Tehillim said, And all the nations of the earth will witness the salvation wrought by God. All the nations of the world, where Achashverosh was king over 127 providences over the entire world, he, they saw the salvation of the Jews. But when did they see the salvation of the Jews? Only at the very end. So what does this teach us? This teaches us we cannot see the ways of Hashem. It's only in the end that we'll be able to see the ways of Hashem. But everything along the way, Hashem was there. And that's exactly what the story of Purim is about. That all the mundane things, all the things which seem to be happening naturally, you meet this person, you speak to that person, this happens, that happens, really Hashem is doing all of it, but you don't see it. It's only in the end that you understand. And if you look back in your life, of course you see, well, thank God I didn't marry that girl. Girl, or thank God this happened. There's bad things that appear to be happening or not bad at all. And that's what he says. He says, During the remainder of the year, we anticipate and yearn for salvation that will end our suffering and reveal the concealed presence on God. But on pouring the anticipation for redemption, if I was hoping and anticipating that the final salvation will appear to make apparent that there was never any hiddenness and concealment. In the end, it's revealed that God himself did everything. That's the story of Purim. God was there each step of the way. And this is an unbelievable lesson in happiness. How can we be happy? The only way we could be happy is we understand that every detail of our lives is occurring because Hashem is the one that's doing it. We can't see it now, but in the long run we can. But the Chachamim, the great sages and the great rabbis understood it along the way. And you can see a proof from Rashi. What does Rashi say in the Megillah? He says on the verse, it says, And every day Mordechai would walk about in the front of the court of the house of the woman to learn Esther's welfare and what would be done to her. What happened to Mordechai? According to most opinions, Esther was his wife. They took his wife away and they gave him to a non-Jewish king. Can you imagine? You'd be devastated. And that's why the verse said he was outside, wondering what's going to be with her. But Rashi explains, listen to this. Mordechai said to himself, the only reason that this righteous woman was taken to the bed of a non-Jewish king must be that she's destined to arise and save the Jewish people. He therefore went around to find out what would be her fate. In other words, Mordechai understood this crazy thing happened. They took my wife and, and they gave her to a non-Jewish king. Oh, what does he say to himself? It must be that she's in there to become the princess in order to save the Jewish people. And we're going to need her. Listen to this perspective. It's unbelievable. Instead of being depressed, instead of being down and, and, and finished, no. He looks at it in a positive understanding because he understands there's got to be a bigger picture. I don't see the bigger picture. I only see a small sliver of time. But if I look over the long run, there must be a reason for what happened. And that was his attitude. It's unbelievable. He understood that this horrible thing that's happening must be there to save the Jewish people. And it's such a high level to be able to look at life that way, to see all the details of your life, something bad happens, to have an attitude. No, God's doing it. Why did it happen? And Rev. Dessler explains on the Rashi, which is the same thing as the Yalkut Shmoni, he explains there like this. He says, God finds it necessary to punish Israel. He generally provides the cure beforehand in order to teach us that the sole purpose of the punishment is to induce us to do tshuva, that we should return to him. So to make the punishment unnecessary. And Mordechai sensed this exactly when he saw that his, that his wife went to Achosh the concept is that the cure comes before the disease. A refuah lifnei maka. The cure comes, everything that Hashem's doing is a cure. It's to help us. What's going on? Why, why are we suffering? We're only suffering that Hashem wants to help us. And if we look at it that way, we'll see that the cure comes before the patch. We don't understand the bigger picture. We don't know why Hashem's doing what He does. He does things for reason. Like it says in Tehillim, it says like this. It's a famous Tehillim that we read every Shabbos. How great are your deeds, Hashem. Exceedingly profound are your thoughts. A boar cannot know, and a fool cannot understand this. When the wicked bloom like grass, and all the iniquitous blossom, it is destroyed them for eternity. 
but you, Hashem, remain forever. We see a boar can't not know and a fool cannot understand. So the Mephoshim explain, it says the fool cannot understand this. You know what they do? They say, listen, there's one thing I don't understand this story. Since there's one thing I don't understand, must be there's no God, there's no good, and things are not just, things are not fair. Where is God in the story? Because the one thing I don't understand. No, we can't have that attitude. He, the Pusik is explaining that evil occurs. Why do bad things occur? So they should be wiped out forever. They should be gone. Really what happened up in Kabbalah is that if Adam or Rishon would have not sinned, so everything would have been fine. But since he sinned, it's like the light spilled all over the place. And since the light spilled all over the place, it's in dark places. Now it has to come back. So all the energies that evil has only comes from good. Now what happens is, is the evil is done and perpetrated and then it uses up its energy and it's gone forever. That's exactly what the verse says. When the wicked bloom like grass and the iniquitous blossom, it is to destroy them for eternity. And the Midrash in Esther Rabbis is like this. It says that the enemies of God are raised to meet their downfall. God lifts up the enemies of the Jewish people in order they should fall down. It may be likened to a slave who cursed the king's son. So then the king says, listen, if I kill this slave, nobody's going to notice and nobody's going to learn anything from it. I'm going to do the opposite. I'm going to take the slave. I'm going to promote him to be somebody famous in the government. And then I'm going to kill him. And then everybody's going to see, whoa, you can't go against the king's son. You can't go against the Jewish people. So too, the same thing with Haman. It says, I caused Haman to prosper and succeed so he should hang to teach the world retribution against evil. Hashem rose up Haman to show the world that this is wrong. Don't go against the Jewish people. What are you doing? It's evil what you're doing. But Hashem did the evil in order that there should be a Kiddush Hashem, that people should understand the right way. And that's why he brought evil. And meanwhile, we were crying, and we didn't know what's happening. What's happening to me? This decree against the Jewish people. We're all going to die. I have a void. But Hashem was behind the scenes at every moment along the way. And he was doing it to show the world, watch this. Watch the salvation of the Jewish people. He was doing it for a reason. But if Rukhachami would have understood that along the way, and that's what Mordechai understood. He understood that Esther went with Achoshverosh in order that the Jewish people should be saved. And not only that, but the Shem Shmuel explains there was another reason for it. Why? Hashem wanted that the Jewish people should unite. Because of our decree that we're about to be destroyed and the Jews were all over the place, he wanted them to unite. Why he wanted them to unite? It says, Kibu Kiblu, and in order they should accept the Torah again with love. So Hashem made a horrible situation. Hashem made a crisis in order that we should come together in order to receive the t Torah. And it says what it says by Kibu Kiblu, it says Kibel. It's actually written in the Megillah singular that the Jewish people united just like the, in, in order to receive the Torah the first time, we had to unite as one people, with one lay, lay the chad, also to receive the oral tradition, with ava, with love, and with fear, we had to unite. And that was the reason why Hashem made this horrible situation, we were about to all be destroyed. But we would have seen it, l'chachila, we would have understood Hashem had a plan. Without this, we never would have received the Torah with true love. That's what it says, I'm poor and we received the Torah with true love. It wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for the bad decrees of Haman. And Revolbi brings over Yerucham, who explains there's many reasons why Hashem brings these tremendous crises among, upon the Jewish people. For example, he says the Kriyas Yamsuf. The main purpose of Kriyas Yamsuf was not to have the miracle that the sea split. No, he says no. He wanted to show the Jewish people that there was no natural way out of the predicament and they were compelled to come unto Hashem. Listen to this, this is unbelievable. The purpose of the Jews having to cross the Red Sea and the sea splitting was not to show the miracle that Hashem split the sea. It was there to show the Jews, listen, there is no natural way out. And since there's no natural way out, you're going to have to change your focus. <laughs> you're going to have to come on to God. You're going to have to pray. You have to realize that I'm here. I'm behind the scenes here. Hashem is saying, I'm behind Teva. I'm behind nature. There is no natural way out. And that's why Hashem made that the Jews are standing there at Kriyas Yamsuf. And behind them are the Mitzrayim. And they're about to be killed. And there is no way out. 
So they were compelled to change their focus towards God. And that's why Hashem made the Tsar, the tremendous. Can you imagine the emotional turmoil that the Jews had? They're about to be wiped out. They're like in the Holocaust. They're about to be wiped out. So what's the emotional reaction? The real level that we should be on is we have to understand that Hashem is doing it in order that we should come on to Him, that we should change our focus. And many things in our lives, all the suffering and all the hardships and all the horrible things that we have to go through are just there for us to realize that we have to come unto Hashem, and that's why Hashem's doing it to us. There's a much higher reason. Revolbi says, Divine providence often removes all viable options in order for us to redirect our focus so that instead of turning to outsiders for help, we are forced to turn our gaze inward and come to the realization that only Hashem can help us. And he says that's exactly what happened in Purim. The Gemara Megillah says, Greater was the removal of the ring from Akashverosh to Haman than the 48 prophets. The Jews didn't listen to the 48 prophets. The prophets keep telling them to do tshuva, change yourselves, purify yourselves. You have to grow. You have to move. It didn't help. What helped? When the ring went from Akashverosh to Haman, and they saw the decree, that's it. You're about to be wiped out. There's a decree you're about to be wiped out. What was it there for? It was there for the Jews to do tshuva, for them to return to Hashem. That's why it was there. It's not evil in the sense of pure evil. No, it's there for a reason. If we have the bigger picture, we understand that Hashem is behind the scenes, and we understand that Hashem is kulotov, He's good, and everything that's happening to us is a shkaka pratas. It's details that are coming exactly from Hashem, who you meet, who you speak to, what happened, this thing and that thing, all these things that are happening to us. We have to understand that they're there, that Hashem is behind the scenes. That's what we learn from the Megillah. And this is what Rucham Shmuel Levitch says we learn from Purim, to have Amuna Pashuta, a simple faith. He says, the verse says, Know your God and your Father and serve Him. It's very simple. You just serve God. Whatever is happening is not your business in a certain sense. Hashem's running the world. You think you're running the world? No, Hashem's running the world. So in the end of the day, Purim itself teaches us the secret to being happy. It says you have to drink until you don't know. You don't know what? You don't know the difference between blessed is Mordechai and cursed is Haman. What do you mean you don't know? That's right, you don't know. That is the secret to happiness. The secret to happiness is understanding that you don't know. When you see something happen, you have to assume it's for your good. You have to assume that Hashem did it. When Mordechai's wife was taken away and given to a non-Jewish king, he said, oh, must be Hashem has a plan. When things happen to you, you have to be in a level. That's what we learn from Purim. We learn that Purim, the secret to happiness is to say, I don't know. I don't know what's happening. All I know with Amun Pashuta, with my simple faith, I know that Hashem is doing it. And I know Hashem is behind the scenes. I know that everything is Minish Shemaim. Everything comes from God. Every single detail. And when I understand that, and I really believe it, that creates happiness. I don't have to judge in this happening, all these bad things are happening, all these bad things are happening. I have to be above my emotions. I saw a video of Rev Torsky. Actually, it's on my website. You go to globalyeshiva.com. You look there, it says being a mensch. He speaks about if your emotions are normal, like a normal human being, that's called being a behemoth. That's an animal. The emotions that you were given as a child are animalistic. Somebody gives you a patch, you want to give them a patch back. Somebody does this to you, I know what, you get upset about this. And I, those are animalistic emotions. Being a mensch, being above those emotions, that's what a true Jew has to be, above your emotions. You have to see the world through a different set of glasses. You have to understand that everything that's happening is when it's Shemayim. Everything is God's doing it. I don't understand. And you have to say, I don't know. But it's not going to upset me. Because why it's not going to upset me? Because I don't know. I don't know in the bigger picture. And you see the same thing in your, in your life. The longer you live, you say, oh, thank God. I said, thank God I didn't marry that girl. And thank God that this didn't happen. And all the bad things that I thought were happening were really good things. Bad things, it looks like bad things. It only grow when a person only grows when bad things happen. When the bad things happen, it's there to bring out the Jews, to bring out the myths. In other words, the bad things are happening in order to get you to this level. To order to realize how am I going to be happy with my life? How can I possibly be happy? 
It's impossible, Rabbi. It's impossible. This, this is happening. My wife is not nice to me. My kids are off the derech. And that's happening. And this is happening. Come on. What are you talking about? Avram's kid was off a of derech. Yitzchak's kid was off a of derech. Uh, all, all the a thousand things were going wrong. And every Jewish, every Jewish sage, every Jew, great David Amalek's son tried to kill him. And then he had the story with Tamar. It's endless. All the sufferings that the Jews were going through, it's endless suffering. So how are you supposed to be happy if all these crazy things are happening to me, all these bad things are happening to me? The answer is, I don't know. And that's why I'm poor. You have to drink to the point where you say, I don't know. I don't know the difference between a blessing and a curse. I don't know. And when you say, I don't know, that's when you're going to be happy. Here's a powerful parable to open your mind and help you reach your potential. Rev. Dessler brings down that a person who has real faith doesn't question Hashem. He's not plagued by the many questions that trouble most of the world's population. What does he say? There's a muscle. There's a muscle to understand this. What's the muscle? He says, it's compared to a person who's looking through a keyhole of a door and he sees inside a pen, and the pen is writing. It's amazing. His limited vision only allows him to see the piece of paper and the pen writing. And then he watches the pen write word after word and line after line, never realizing that the pen is being held by a person who's really doing the writing. If he would just open the door, he would see that there's a person inside doing the writing. And there's much more to the scene than meets the eye. So that was the mushal. What's the nimshal? What do we learn from that? The same thing. We don't see God behind the scenes. We're just looking through a little people. We have a small section of reality that we see. We don't see the entire reality that God's behind everything. But if we would just open up a door, we would see that God is really there. It's time for Great Stories About Great Rabbis. So this is a story about Rav Yitzchak Zilberstein. One time he was invited to a wedding, and the bride is there sitting on the bridal chair in the hall, waiting for the groom to arrive. And the clock keeps ticking and ticking. They're waiting for the groom. What's going on? Finally, he gets a telephone call. The groom has decided to call off the wedding. Everybody's there. I don't know, a couple hundred people there at the wedding. Can you imagine the feelings of the girl? She's devastated, humiliated. It's undescribable. And all the relatives and everybody, oh, what a scene. Can you imagine such a scene? So the father came and asked him to speak to the bride. What is he going to say to the bride? So he says, I told her this following story. There's a Gemara in Kasubas that says that Rebbe wanted to marry off his son to the daughters of Rev Chia. The daughters of Rev Chia were very praised inside the Talmud of being on a very high level. So what happened? The wedding came, and at the chupa, the bride passed away. So then Rebbe said, is there, heaven forbid, a disqualification in one of our families? He also saw, he saw, why, why, why did this happen? There must be a reason for this. If we see Hashem cause this tragedy to happen, there must be a reason for it. Perhaps the families were unsuited to join in marriage. So they checked out the lineage, and it was true. Rebbe came from royal blood, and Rev Chia was not from royal blood. So Rev Zilberstein told the bride, he said like this, there are times that people think that a shidduch is a wonderful thing, and the groom and the bride are perfectly suited for each other. But heaven knows otherwise. There are shidduchim where it's appropriate that they should be dropped even at the last moment. And even if his embarrassment is overwhelming, Hashem knows what's the best for a person. And if you would have got married, it probably would have turned out much worse than what you're going through right now. Learn to give, love, and this is Peace in Your Home. So Rev. Victor Miller speaks about peace in the home, and he speaks about Purim. He says a lot of people who are not that religious, they skip Purim. In America, they have Purim. By the, by the not religious, they don't have Purim. He says it's a major mistake. He says, what do they have instead? They have Thanksgiving. So he says, listen, if your friends want to come over on Thanksgiving, you tell them you're busy. And you tell them instead, come over on Purim. Why? Because these holidays that we have create unity in the family. 
Because he says, A joyous Purim gives the merry heart, which is a continual feast, the Pasuk and Mishle, all year. That's what, the, that's what it says. He quotes the Orach Chaim. He says, If you're happy in Purim, you can give happiness for the entire year. He says, Adorning the home with as many holy festivals and Torah celebrations as possible, Pesach, Shavuot, Sukkot, Purim, Hanukkah, Lag Baomer, even Issachag and Rosh Chodesh, all these things, if you serve Hashem with Simcha, if you have these holidays in your house, it brings beauty into the house. It brings happiness into the house. It brings peace into your house. The home is regarded as a place of happiness and Torah idealism. He says even people who are not religious, famous poets and painters, Jews who are the most distant from Judaism, they still have as their themes the Pesach Seder. You have painters of non-religious Jews painting the Pesach Seder and poets and singers singing about the Pesach Seder. Why was that? Because when they were kids and they were at their grandparents' Pesach Seder, it gave them a feeling of belonging, a feeling of happiness, a feeling of unity, a feeling that you're taken care of, a feeling that, of love. The holidays bring love into the house. I remember as a little kid, five years old, singing Manishtana under the table of my grandparents during the Seder. There was a feeling there. There was a feeling of happiness, a feeling of love that people cared about you. It's so important. He says, the true Jewish home possesses a powerful attraction. It's our duty to enhance the best, with the best of our ability the Jewish home, to make the mitzvahs beautiful, that the, everyone in the house should feel the beauty of the Torah. And he says, especially in view of the unending campaign that the nations try to knock Jews and Judaism, and even the disloyal Jews are trying to knock out Judaism, we have to hold the banner high of true Judaism and demonstrate its genuine beauty and the joy of living a Torah life. The holidays themselves bring peace into our homes. Okay, that's it for this week's Torah podcast. Please share it with your friends and please leave comments. Thank you for listening. To get more enthusiasm for your Judaism, become a free member at globalyeshiva.com. 